Hello, thank you for virtually attending my talk. I hope you're enjoying the day. My name's Craig Buckler and I'm a freelance UK web developer and author. And today I want to talk to you about a JavaScript runtime. It's based on Chrome's V8 engine. It was developed by Ryan Dahl. It's ideal for scripting and it's great for web applications. And of course, that's Node.js. But it's also Dino, which is a remix of Node created with the benefit of a decade's worth of hindsight. The first beta appeared in 2018 and version one was released on the 13th of May, 2020. But that doesn't mean that Dino is a sequel or superior to Node. It just takes a slightly different approach. We have yet another option in our huge JavaScript ecosystem. Okay, so I've got to be honest, I still don't know how to pronounce this word. Now, being British, I started calling it Deno. And so did Ryan Dahl in his early videos. But most people seem to opt for Dino, and that's possibly because it's spelt the same as Reno in Nevada, or because its logo is a huge, great flipping dinosaur. So I'm going to try and call it Dino throughout, but I'll probably slip into Deno every so often, so apologies now. Uh, to be honest, I wish he'd named it that because it would have been easier to pronounce and possibly a bit more appropriate. If you've never used Node or Dino before, they are JavaScript runtimes. JavaScript is the coding language used in browsers for client-side scripting. And both Node and Dino allow you to use it in scripts which run on your OS. And they have APIs to access the file system in the network. And once you've coded something, you run it with Node or Dino Run. And all runtimes do much the same thing, just with different languages, whether that's JavaScript, PHP, Python, Ruby, Rust, or Go. Now, Node was released in 2009, and it took the V8 JavaScript engine used in Google Chrome and wrapped it in a C++ container. And it had several benefits. V8 is very fast and lightweight. It's highly optimized for runtime scripts. Web developers were already familiar with the JavaScript syntax, so there was less cognitive overload when switching between languages. And it simplified some development. You're often transmitting data between two JavaScript engines, and that can be easier than parsing it to different data structures for use in other languages. Now, server implementations of JavaScript have been around since the mid 90s, but node usage exploded. It's open source, it's available on all operating systems, it's easy to use, and has been adapted for a wide variety of environments. You'll find it in embedded systems and even the SpaceX rockets. And developers in other languages often use Node tools during their build processes. But if Node has been so successful, is there any point in releasing another JavaScript runtime? Well, this would be a very short presentation if there wasn't, so let's look at some of the key differences. First, Dino has security baked in. Now, I'm not usually brave enough for live coding, but virtual me is far more courageous. So here's a small node script, which outputs the values of all environment variables. And we can run this with node info node.js and everything works. So let's have a look at the equivalent in Dino. Like Node, it's got a read eval a print loop console, so we can start it with Dino. And we can use Dino's API to output environment variables. It's just dino.env. So that works fine. But things get interesting when we try and output the same information from a script. So here's info-dino.js, which we can run with dino run info-dino.js. And this gives us a permission denied error and tells us we have to use an allow env flag. And that's to access environment variables. And now it works. Now there are similar flags for allowing network or file access, and you can even limit access to specific domains and folders. 
And there's an API, so your application can ask the user to grab permissions as it runs. Now this may seem like a pain at first, but it provides a useful safety net. You can use someone else's code without any fear that it's gonna wipe your OS or start mining cryptocurrency. And it also means that it's far more difficult for someone to do damage by compromising your code. Okay, security is not particularly exciting. So is anyone using TypeScript? Perhaps we could have a show of emoji hands in the chat box or something. Now surveys are to be believed, around a quarter of developers are using TypeScript and two thirds of those absolutely love it. So here's a small TypeScript file, which has a function that returns a single environment variable. Now I don't use TypeScript because it's difficult to get out of my JavaScript habit. So apologies if this code offends anyone. Uh, but to run TypeScript in the browser or node, you need to compile it to JavaScript first. But let's see what happens if we run it directly in Dino. And we use Dino run, we still need the allow env setting and info.ts. And it works. And that's because Dino has first class support for TypeScript. There's no need for a compiler and your projects can mix JavaScript and TypeScript without any issues whatsoever. Node introduced the Node Package Manager or NPM. It gave developers an easy way to search for modules and include them within their applications. And it's a single command to publish your own modules. It's become the most successful package manager ever devised with almost one and a half million modules and more than 800 new ones arriving every single day. But there are some issues. So back in 2009, JavaScript didn't have a standard module system. That does seem odd, but it was partly because of its browser heritage. There were a few community workarounds and CommonJS was adopted for Node. But then standard ES6 modules arrived in 2015. And we now have this weird situation where browsers can use ES6 modules while Node still uses CommonJS. Now superficially, they look quite similar, but they work in very different ways. And it's taken a long time for ES6 modules to arrive in Node, and they're still experimental. The other criticism of NPM is the sheer size of each project's Node modules folder. It can reach hundreds of megabytes as modules require specific versions of other modules which recursively request others. But despite this, NPM was central to Node success. So it's slightly strange to discover that Dino does away with it. There is no package manager. If you want to use a module, you import it by its URL. That's it. Here's some code which creates a simple web server. It just returns hello world on every request. And it imports a module from Dino's standard library. You may also have noticed that await down here is not within an async function. Now this would cause an error in node and ESLint highlights it accordingly. But Dino supports top level awaits. There's no need to wrap await code in an async function. There is one exception to that though, and we'll see it in a moment. Now the first time you run this with Dino run allow net server.js, it downloads all the required modules and their dependencies and caches them locally. And now it's started. If we run it again, it uses the locally cached versions. So you won't see any messages. You can view these dependencies with dino info server.js and it shows a tree of all of them. And you can also open these module URLs in a browser and it shows you the code, which can be very useful and you can get to the documentation. Not only that, you can run a module directly from its URL. I'm just gonna copy up an example here. And this is just a hello world, but it runs it. Now I'm sure you're thinking that this Dino module stuff sounds horrific and how is it sustainable? But most of your concerns will have solutions. 
Now, of course, URLs can go down or disappear forever. And that's an issue which can affect any package manager. And NPM has been hit in the past. And also, NPM allows you to install from a URL too. Now, if you're building a mission-critical node app, it's probably best to add your node modules folder to your repo. And you can do a very similar thing in Dino. You can change the Dino DIR environment variable to point at a directory within your project. Modules will then be cached there, so you can commit them to your repo. Another option is bundling. Dino allows you to bundle all your cache dependencies into a single JavaScript file, which you could use on a production server. Unfortunately, bundling doesn't currently support top-level awaits in your main script. It's a known bug, and it will be fixed in a future release. But you can get around it today by wrapping awaits in anonymous async functions like you do in Node. So to bundle a script into a single file, you use dino bundle, followed by the name of your script, and the name of the output file. Be wary of these commands because Dino will happily overwrite existing files. You can then run that bundled script as before. And it won't need to load any other resources. The module URLs you've seen so far fetch the latest releases from the standard library at dino.land. But the convention is to choose a specific numbered version. So this URL selects version 0.61 of the server module, so we would know we're using the same code everywhere. You could release modules on your own server using a similar convention, but your site could receive a ton of traffic as it becomes popular. A more robust method is to use GitHub and assign a tag to every release. You can then reference a tagged version of your repo using sites such as dinopkg.com or unpkg.com. Now, what if you're importing the same module in dozens of places throughout your code? If you want to update the URL, you'd need to search and replace every reference. But there are a couple of options to work around that. The first is a dependencies file, typically named deps.js. This contains a single reference to every module you're using throughout the whole of your project. In this case, it's just the standard Dino datetime library. In your other files, you then import module functions from that dependency file. So if the date time library is updated, you need only change the module URL in one place. Another option is import maps. Now these are small JSON files which assign a name to a full or partial URL. In this case, it's Dino's standard file system library. You can then make an import map reference in any script. You then need to pass an import map argument when running it. But be aware this is an unstable feature which may change, so you need to use the unstable flag. Now more worrying is that code reference from a URL could be changed or hacked without your knowledge. And some high profile sites have been compromised in that way because they link directly to third party code. Now Dino addresses this problem with integrity checking. This stores a checksum for every module in a small JSON file. It's easier if we have a single dependencies file like we saw before. The original developer would run a dino cache command to create a lock.json file which is added to the repo. When another developer clones that repo, they also use a dino cache command to reload each module and check its integrity. Now at the moment, this is an unenforced manual process, so you should probably run it as a git hook or something similar. Or just do what every other team does and adopt a blame culture. You'll easily find common Dino modules like database connectors. Around 800 modules are listed on the Dino website at dino.land x. But it'd be great to use any of the 1.5 million node modules if you need something a little more unusual. So many of Node's APIs have been replicated into the standard Dino library at dino.land slash std slash node. And there are also some CDNs which can convert NPM packages to ES6 modules. These include pika.dev, skypack.dev, jspm.io, and unpkg.com. Whether they work without problems is another matter. But as things evolve, it's likely we'll see modules which work on both Node and Dino without any special treatment. 
I've talked a lot about Dino's module system and referencing by URL is going to be controversial. I think one of the biggest problems is there's no central location to search for modules and verify their popularity. There are some Dino approved and unapproved lists, but it's still clunky compared to NPM, even if that does return 500 results for every search term. And then there's the problem of updating dependencies. In Node, it's very easy. You can run NPM outdated and get a list of all modules with updates. There are a few Dino projects which work in a similar way, but they all rely on a single dependency file or import maps. But one thing's for sure, Dino's module ecosystem will evolve. There's a lot of useful stuff built into Dino, which normally would require third-party modules in Node. You can see a list by typing Dino help or Dino help followed by a command you want help with. You can view documentation in the terminal with Dino doc followed by a module URL. And there's a documentation generator which parses js.comments in your files. There's a linter for checking code syntax and a formatter for prettifying it. Be a little wary about using this because it will recursively format every file in every subdirectory and there's no configuration options yet, so it does horrible things like enforcing double quote strings. There's also an install command which installs your application as an executable, which can be run anywhere on your system. But perhaps the most useful feature is the built-in testing API named dino.test. To demonstrate, I'll test the TypeScript environment variable function we used earlier. I've got a short test.js script which loads some assertion modules and of course the getEnv function that we want to test. It then passes in some description strings and some testing functions to dino.test. To run it, we enter dino test plus any necessary permission flags such as allow env. And Dino will run any script named something with test before the file extension dot. And we can see here that our tests ran fine. And there are a few modules which supplement testing, but they all use Dino.test below the surface. And as well as testing, you also have access to the same V8 debugger that you may have used in Node. And that allows you to attach and step through commands on a running Dino process using Chrome DevTools, VS Code, or a variety of other editors. Perhaps one of the most underrated features in Dino is that it implements several browser APIs. And when you use Node for the first time, it's quite strange to discover that certain JavaScript features aren't available. There's no window object, you can't set event listeners, web workers aren't available, and you can't use the fetch API to make server requests. Dino implements many of these APIs and they're used in an identical way. So here we have a script which attaches load and unload events to the window object. Now if you run this in Node, it fails immediately. But run it in Dino and it works fine. And it would also run in a web browser. With Dino, the dream of isomorphic JavaScript may finally become a reality. The libraries you write can work on the client or the server without any changes. So should you dump Node for Dino? Node is not dead and it's not going anywhere. It's mature and it's got a decade's worth of updates, modules, techniques, documentation and experience behind it. Of course Dino adopts some of that knowledge, but it's still very new. I'd be wary about using Dino for mission critical apps. The framework is likely to evolve quite rapidly in the coming years. And some features aren't stable just yet. There are relatively few modules. Uh, you'll find common things like database drivers, but don't expect the varied range that you get in Node. Documentation is quite sparse and can be a little hard going. And you're not gonna find developers with five years experience. Not that that'll stop agencies advertising for them. And you won't get any performance gains because Node and Dino use the same V8 engine. 
Now, HTTP server performance is actually a little slower in Dino because it's implemented in TypeScript rather than C++. There are a few latency benefits, but you won't notice any real differences. But Dino is receiving a lot of attention, and it smooths over some of the cracks that you find in Node. My advice, by all means use it for smaller projects, especially OS level tasks such as data manipulation or build tools. If you're into TypeScript, Dino is definitely worth considering because it's natively supported and it cuts out that build step. And if you're new to development or coming from another language, Dino may offer a slightly easier experience than Node. But if you're already a Node developer, you won't have any trouble transitioning between the two frameworks. But Dino will be big, probably dinosaur sized. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Craig Buckler, and you can find me at craigbuckler.com or on Twitter at Craig Buckler. It'd be great to hear what you're doing with Dino and whether you can pronounce it any better than I can.